Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Genesis today, Genesis chapter 4, and uh, we resume our study in verse number 5, actually, but I'm going to go back and begin reading in verse 1. We're going to look at the birth of Cain and Abel and also their religion, as it were. Genesis chapter 4. So grab your Bible, open it up, if you can do that. Scripture verse by verse can be heard at thebibleversebyverse.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Verse by verse. Teaching the Bible from Genesis through Revelation. 30 years of teaching is there for you, three times through the Bible in its entirety. And now the fourth is what we have just begun a few broadcasts ago. So go there and check it out and begin a verse-by-verse study in the Word of God. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. I hope you have your Bible open to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 4, and we're going to pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, verse 1. We covered these uh, first four verses last time, but I do want to read them, kind of set the stage. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. Doesn't mean she... She was known by him in a sense of, hey, I know you. It means that he had sexual relations with her. As I said last time, it's a very dignified way of speaking of this subject that God uses. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And we saw last time that she actually thought that uh, she had given birth to the Redeemer that would crush the head of the devil and redeem them from their sins. She thought it was, she thought it was Cain. God had promised a Redeemer, and she didn't think God wasted any time. You know, she, he got right to it. Two, and she again bore his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Both had normal jobs, occupation. These were the first, you know, first family of humans. So, you know, you're, you're not looking at cavemen grunting and eating raw meat until they figure out how to invent fire, as the evolutionists will tell you. Three, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought her the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And, and again, I mentioned last time that I know there are those who say that Cain really made a, a big mistake by offering the fruit of the ground, fruits and vegetables, to God instead of a lamb like Abel will offer. Um, but I don't see anywhere in Scripture. I think that's reading into Scripture, to be honest with you. Yes, if it was a sin offering, I would agree. But it doesn't say that it was supposed to be a sin offering. It was just an offering. And I compared it to tithes today. We give offerings like this all the time. The fruit of our work, right? That's what Cain did. And, and it wasn't, as I mentioned last time, what Cain gave that was the problem. It was his attitude. He didn't care about God. And if you don't care about God, God doesn't want anything that you have. If you don't have your first love for Jesus as he speaks of in Revelation chapter 3, then he doesn't want anything from you. You can have all the good works in the world. You can be a well-oiled religious machine. You can give. You can suffer for your faith. You can do all those things. But if you're not doing it out of a love for Jesus because you love him with that first love that you had when you first came to Christ, then God doesn't want it. It's a waste. 
But it says, Abel brought also of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. So it was the firstlings. And we know from the book of Hebrews that, that Abel gave his offering by faith and, and Cain did not. And that, again, was the difference. The Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and his offering, he had not respect. It's not that he didn't care about cucumbers and melons and, and stuff like that and hated the idea of being offered that. Again, if it was a sin offering, yeah, then, uh, then it needed to be a bloody sacrifice. But uh, an innocent animal need to be, needed to be killed. But, you know, that was not instituted officially until the uh, Levitical law, the law given to Moses, and although God did kill a an animal and clothe uh, Adam and Eve after they sinned, so the message was sent that an innocent animal was going to have to suffer to cover man's sins until the Messiah, the Redeemer, would come and pay for them. Um, this particular offering, I just, again, don't see anywhere where God commanded it to be a sin offering. It was just in the process of time. They brought offerings. So, be that as it may, God was happy with Abel's, and he was not happy with Cain, and I told you why I think that was the case. And then it says in, uh, well, let's read verse 5 again. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Cain was angry because God rejected his gift. Well, God rejected his gift because Cain did not want to give it. And we know that from the book of Hebrews. It's like if somebody, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I have. A long time ago. And I still remember how I felt. It's like when somebody does you a favor, okay, and they make sure that you know that it's a terrible hardship, even if it isn't. <laughs> or they make sure that you know that they don't want to do it. So, yeah, they do you a favor and it doesn't cost anything, but you pay by enduring the looks on their faith, face or, or their frustration. They make you pay. Boy, you're going you're gonna to know that I don't want to. Do, I'll do this favor because I'm a good Christian man. But I'm going to make you pay. Yeah, see, that's that's kind of what this was with Cain and God. And at that point, you just want to say, keep it. I don't want your favor. I'll do without it. And that's how God felt about Cain's offering. If I'm, if I'm that big of a pain to you, Cain, then just keep your cucumbers. I don't want them. And that was the problem. And, and Cain is angry because God wouldn't accept his offering. Well, <laughs> would you? I doubt it. You wouldn't be happy with it, and God wasn't. And then Cain's angry because God wasn't happy. Well, what did he expect? Verse 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Cain, if you get rid of your sinful attitude, you're not going to be so miserable. That's what God is saying. You're miserable. Cain is miserable because of his sinful attitude. His countenance is falling. He's miserable. He's sad. He's angry. He's headed for depression. You know, a lot of depression is caused by, sin, by a sinful attitude and disobedience to God. And then, especially depression, a lot of it is caused by a sinful attitude, disobedience to God, and then a failure to repent of that disobedience. That's when it really turns into depression. We're not made to disobey God. It doesn't fit us. So Cain needs to quit being so self-centered. He needs to quit babying himself and start caring about God or he is going to be on a slippery path to hell. In fact, he already is on that path. Again, verse 7. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Let's just stop there for a second. 
See, it's up to Cain. God says, it's up to you. If you do well, if you don't do well, if you do well, this is going to happen. If you don't do well, this is going to happen. It's up to Cain. If he wants to continue in sin, then he can do that. But God is suggesting and actually warning that he shouldn't do that. Or it's just going to go from bad to worse. If he stops doing wrong and he starts doing right, his life is going to take a turn for the better. But if he continues in sin, things will go from bad to worse. Again, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Thou shalt rule over him. And right now, Cain isn't feeling very good, is he? And I don't think he likes God much. And I don't think he feels like doing right much. And that's going to become very clear. And there are those who say, well, we got to work on Cain's feelings. You know, there are those in the church today who would tell you that in order for a Christian to be able to do what is right, he must first feel right. That's a very popular notion. In order to do right, you have to feel right. That is completely unbiblical. God suggests just the opposite. He told Cain, Cain, and Cain obviously didn't feel like doing right, but he said, Cain, if you do right, then you will start to feel right. Your countenance will be lifted if you do right first. Make a choice. A lot of times people don't feel like reading the Word of God, so they don't read the Word of God because they don't feel like it. They don't feel like praying, so they don't pray. They don't feel like obeying God, so they don't obey God. They go with their feelings. That's the wrong way. You start doing what is right, and feelings will come along. But you have to make obedience is always and very first a choice. If we have to go against our feelings in order to do what we know God says we should do, then we ought to bite the bullet and do it. Gird up our loins and do it. Because, you know, doing right doesn't get any easier by putting it off. Verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And doesn't say how he killed him. A lot of people, a lot of people assume that he hit him over the head with a club or something. But uh, we don't know that for sure. But we do know that Cain went with his feelings instead of going with the word of God. God had been so clear in what he said to them, to Cain. And Cain went with his feelings instead of the word of God. And if he thinks he solved his problem by killing his brother, he didn't. Because Abel wasn't his problem. Cain was his problem. Cain was his own problem. It's like the old song from the 60s. Don't you know don't you know, no matter what you do, you never run away from you. Sometimes sin does appear to be a quick and easy solution, a quick and easy relief, but it never is. It only makes matters worse. As Cain is about to discover, notice verse 9, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? Well, God knew where Abel was. God knew that Cain killed him. God was just trying to get Cain to confess his sin so that, so that he could forgive him. So that's what he tried to do with Adam and Eve too, remember? He tried to get Adam and Eve to confess their sin by asking them questions. God always tries to elicit confession because that's the only way that we can get forgiven we have to come clean before the lord don't make up any excuses just come clean and confess 
But that's why he's asking King this question, so he can forgive him if he, if he does confess. There's still hope for Cain. If he confesses, he can be forgiven. He can start over with God. There's hope for you. Maybe you've committed horrible sins. Maybe you committed sins 20, 30 years ago. And they're just being brought back to your memory right now. Get down on your knees. Confess those sins. Ask God for forgiveness. He'll forgive you. <clears throat> Again, verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Liar. I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, that's really stepping over the line. God will forgive any sin, even the sin of murder, if it is confessed. But the Bible says if you conceal your sin, you're going to be punished. And instead of confessing his sin, Cain tells a lie. I don't know where my brother is. Lie. And that was bad. He blew an opportunity to confess and be forgiven. That was bad. But boy, he pushed God way too far when he followed that up by smarting off. Am I my brother's keeper? Smart Alec. He treated God with contempt. And he's not going to get away with that. Notice, verse 10, God lays down the law. And he, God said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Cain rejected every opportunity that God gave him to repent. Instead of repenting, he lied. Instead of confessing, he sassed. And now it's God's turn. He rejected God's grace. So now he's going to have to endure God's wrath. God is often patient with sinners, but that doesn't mean he's soft on sin because he is not. Verse 12, when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be on the earth. God's punishment for Cain was more severe than his punishment was on his father, Adam. Did you notice that? And I'm going to tell you why. God's punishment on Adam was this. It was going to take hard work for Adam to get crops to grow. Cain was a farmer too. God says, Cain, for you, they're not going to grow at all. He just lost his means of livelihood. He's going to have to change jobs. Why the difference? Why more severe? Because, because, Cain had more spiritual light than Adam. He sinned against more knowledge than Adam. Adam was kicked out of paradise. Well, that was bad. To be kicked out of paradise, that's bad. Cain would simply wander. He wouldn't have any place. At least Cain was, or at least Adam was just right outside the, the borders of paradise if he wanted. He could, you know, sit on the uh, fence, as it were. But again, Cain had more spiritual light than Adam. Cain had seen the fallout from Adam's sin. He knew that it was wrong to commit sin, Cain, to, to disobey the word of God. And he did disobey the word of God. God tried to talk him out of, you know, doing what was wrong. And so he saw the fallout of sin. Cain had God pleading with him to do the correct thing during his temptation. But Cain did it anyway. Cain's sin was worse, so his punishment was worse. 
God knows the difference. He keeps track of those things. You know that? There are different degrees of suffering in hell depending on how much light you sinned against when you committed your sin. Verse 13, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. First, this is incredible to me. First, Cain rejected God's efforts to keep him from sinning. Well, actually, first, first Cain willfully had an I don't care attitude about God. Gave his offerings as a, as a uh, habit, as a ritual instead of from his heart. Then Cain rejected God's efforts to keep him from sinning even more. Then he rejected God's efforts to get him to confess after he did sin. And now he complains that God's punishment is unfair. Unfair. You want to talk about fair? Cain's fortunate that God didn't execute him on the spot and send him straight to hell. That, that's would have been, that would have been fair. But you know, it's the same self-centeredness that caused Cain to sin now causes him to have the nerve to think that his punishment is too severe. Again, this, see, see what the problem is? Self-centeredness. The same self-centeredness that caused Cain to sin, to do what he wanted, instead of going with the word of God, now causes him to have the nerve to think that his punishment against Almighty God is too strict. Self-centeredness, all the way. Instead of feeling sorry for himself because he's being punished less than his sin actually deserves. Instead of feeling sorry for himself, instead of talking about how unfair life is and how unfair God is, he should be on his knees weeping before God and broken over what his sin has done, number one, to God, number two, to his dead brother Abel, and number three, to his parents. He killed their son. And all he can think about is himself. Boy, that's sinners for you. Fourteen. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone who findeth me shall slave me. I, obviously, um, some time had passed. Well, you know, since this happened, uh, since Adam and Eve, you know, they committed their sin and they had Cain. Well, that took a while, a little while. And they had Abel. And then they grew up. So I don't, it doesn't say how old they were, but they were definitely adults. So I don't know, let's say 20 years old on the low end. Might have been older than that. I don't know. But let's just use that as a ballpark. They were 20 years old. Well, you think Adam and Eve had other children? Within that span of 20, 30 years, who knows how long? Sure they did. They probably had many children. It's just not listed. And the children, probably, they were probably grandparents. That, would, that could have easily been the case. So there was, there were, you know, let's say, I don't know. Let's, it, we could have even, you, it could even be like 100 years have passed. But at any rate, there was, there was plenty of people on the earth, obviously, or Cain, would not have said what he said here. And I can tell you this. Cain's sin is making him paranoid. Don't you think? His thinking is really out of control here. Everyone who sees me is going to kill me. He's miserable. He thought he was miserable before. And God tried to spare him even more misery. But he did the wrong thing. He thought he was miserable before. He is really miserable now. And uh, all I can say is, Cain and others like you, you're sure making a good life for yourself, aren't you? Good 
Good life for yourself, Cain. Boy, you, you've done a good job. Nice job doing things your way instead of God's way. Now you're filled with fear and terror and paranoia. And you're miserable. As miserable as you ever heard. Probably more. Verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, In wrath God remembers mercy. And we see an example of that right here. In spite of everything, and in spite of Cain's lack of repentance after everything, and in spite of him sassing God, in spite of all that stuff, God is kind to Cain by protecting him from vigilantes. Oh, he'll be punished, but not by vigilantes. 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod to the east of Edom. You know what really stood out to me here? Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. You know, that's exactly what he wanted to do. Who forced him to do that? No one. Well, he would have wandered, but he didn't have to wander away from the presence of the Lord because God is any, everywhere. But that's what he wanted. That's what he did. God gave Cain what he wanted, which was life without God. Sometimes people say, you ever hear people say, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? And how could, how could a loving God keep anyone out of heaven? That is the wrong question. Why don't people ask the right question, which is how could a loving God force someone to be with him if they don't want to be with him? God let Cain go. He lived without God. And no doubt he died without God. But that's exactly what he wanted. Life without God. 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after his son Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begot Mehujael, and Mehujael begot Methusael, and Methusael begot Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zilhah. And here's the first. Society's starting to go downhill fast, isn't it? Because this is the first uh, mention of polygamy up until this time. It's just been one man, one woman, as God designed it to be in marriage. Um, but things are changing, as I said, and it continues. Notice verse 20, Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and of, who, and of those who have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who handle the harp and organ. And Zilha, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer of brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. Um, Cain's descendants, as we see from these verses, were just like Cain. There's no mention of God at all, is there, in his offspring? No mention, not at all. They filled their lives with work and entertainment. And there's nothing wrong with work. Work is good. Nothing wrong with entertainment. Entertainment is good. But when you do those things to the exclusion of God, they become idols. 23. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zilha, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man for my wounding and a young man for my hurt. You know, thing, things are, like I said, going downhill really quickly. And when... A society like Cain's society excludes God. Uh, you can throw justice right out the window, and you see that right here. Society will either be too lenient on criminals, or they won't be punished the way they should be, or they'll be punished too severely. Like right here, Lamech kills a young man for striking him, and then he boasts about it. Well, nobody's going to do anything that I don't like. 24. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. In other words, it's all right for me to do what I want to do, but nobody's going to do anything bad back to me. Verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, who Cain slew. 
And to Sleth also were born a son. There was born a son and called his name Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Seth is the beginning of the godly messianic line. And as a matter of fact, the Bible traces the line of Seth right here. All the way down through the whole Old Testament right up to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can find it in the genealogies in the New Testament. Pretty neat. We're going to follow the line of Seth. It'll take us for a few thousand years, 4,000 years, right up to Jesus. I got to go. I'm out of time here. Just a reminder that you can study the whole Bible at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And also a reminder that if the Word of God blesses you, would you please prayerfully consider blessing us back? We are brought to you by your prayers and financial support, and you can give in a secure method at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click on the Donate button at the top of the front page and give us a Lord may lead. It'd be much appreciated. I'm out of time, as I said. We'll see you next time in chapter 5 of Genesis. Until then, so long, everyone.